I don't want it to be too loud, otherwise it'll, it'll scare the online watchers, right? <laughs> All right, let us begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, all of the wonderful work that you did through Martin Luther, and that, that by his faithfulness to you, you brought the gospel back to your people. We thank you that we have been gifted with that gospel, uh, and the word, and the sacraments, and all of your wonderful gifts. Uh, keep us steadfast in those things, and bless us as we continue to study your word uh, in the book of James, that by it our faith would be strengthened. Bless us and keep us in this always. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, let's see. Confirmands, any questions? No? All right, anyone else? Any questions? I, I, I love that in the gospel text, um, it's a great text, I love that he's talking to the, you know, Jesus is talking to the Jews that are believing in him, right? And he's saying, you know, oh, if you, you know, if you abide in my word, then, you know, you will be my disciples, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they say, you know, we're sons of Abraham, we've never been enslaved to anyone. <laughs> It's like they totally forgot all of Exodus, right? Like the, the greatest event in their, their history. It's just so funny, you know, how quickly we forget the past, right? <laughs> that, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and Jesus, you know, he could have been like, come on, guys. Like, don't you remember the time of Moses? Um, but he points to a greater slavery, right? He, he points to the slavery to sin, uh, and that, that you can only be freed by, by Christ in that, um, the, the Son coming and setting you free from, uh, from the house of slavery to sin and death. And so, um, again, Jesus, you know, takes this opportunity to, to teach on an even greater truth than, um, than what we might jump to, you know, and, and pointing to Exodus and whatnot, but... Yeah, great, great texts. All right, any questions? Yeah, Jim. Um, I, I have a question. When we talk about the Word of God, um, I, mean, I, I sort of always assumed that we were talking about, you know, the Bible, Scripture. Uh, but I was reading something about the Eastern Orthodox uh, theology, and they're pretty adamant that when they talk about the Word, they, they're talking about the person of Jesus Christ. Um, mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah, the, the Word of God, right? I mean, it's, it's both of those things, right? So, it, it, the Word is Christ, right? We get this, and they, of course, get this from John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? And then in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? So, so Christ is the Word incarnate. Uh, he is the, the Word of God. You know, pretty much, you know, any time that in fact, a lot of the time that, that God is speaking, it is through, it's through Christ. Um, and, and, you know, we, we say that, you know, this is how Christ is, is present in creation, right? That it is through him that all things are made by the word. Uh, so Christ himself is indeed the, the word of God. Now, we wouldn't say just the person of, of Jesus is, is the word of God, but, you know, the, the scriptures are, are the word of God, and because they stem from God, um, you know, in, where does it say, uh, in, in 1 Peter, um, you know, all, all scripture is breathed out by God, right, so, so every, everything in scripture is, it's not just man, you know, making this stuff up, right, but it is, you know, from God himself, he is the author, it is inspired by the scriptures, so when, so as Lutherans, when we say, you know, Scripture alone, and you know, the the Word of God, it is, you know, it is Christ, uh, but it is it is what we find in the Scriptures, Old and New Testament. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's get into James then. 
All right, so uh, we are in James chapter 5, so open up your Bibles if you haven't already. So last week we were talking about patience and suffering, um, you know, the, the, the being patient, enduring the hardships of this life um, to when Christ will return. <coughs> And so, um, we didn't quite get to verse 12, uh, so I'll just read it real quick. Uh, so James says, But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. So, um, of course, Jesus also taught this right this again here's another example of james not making stuff up on his own uh, but drawing from jesus's teachings uh, in in order to teach in his epistle and so he he's saying here right you know let your yes be yes and, and your no be no don't swear by heaven or by earth or, or any other oath um, and so when when you're trying to you know when you're talking to someone and you say you're going to do something you know, don't say, oh, well, you know, I swear by God in heaven that I'm going to do this, right? And you hear this by, I swear on my mother's grave, blah, 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 you know, all this stuff. Don't do that, basically is what James is saying, you know, be an honest person, tell the truth. And so if you're going to do something, just say, yes, I'm going to do it, and then do it. And don't, don't add all of this extra stuff, especially bringing God's name into it. So then that if you don't do it, then you're, you know... <laughs> Then, then you're, you know, breaking, you're using God's name in vain, you're not holding true to your promise, um, and then that can bring hurt to God's name, it's not hallowing his name. Uh, and so, so here James says, don't do that. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no, uh, and, and strive to the best of your ability to be consistent in that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah, the the swearing in court is always is always the the direct question after these kinds of teachings. Um, my guess is that is where they get this from you know, from Jesus and from James here that says, well, I can't swear any oath, and so I can't you know swear an oath in court. Um, it's probably fine to to you know. You're, you know, you're, you're promising to tell the truth. It's kind of a formality kind of thing. Um, and, and this is, it is really not, you know, right, when he's writing to this, it's not in the context of court, right? He's speaking just in the everyday Christian life, you know, um, and, and how you live, right? And so, so it's, it's not a sin if you're in court for whatever reason. I'm not going to ask why you're in court. Um, but but it, I, I think it is okay to, to go about that. You should tell the truth, right? Don't lie when you get into court. Um, no, there are plenty of people who lie under oath. Yeah. Which is, which, that's a whole nother topic. Um, so yeah, so basically, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. You can do the oaths in court, but... Don't make a habit of that in your daily life. All right, and any, any quick questions on this little piece here? All right, great. All right, so we get into the last section of James here. We'll see if we can finish James today. Wouldn't that be something? We finish the book that Luther doesn't want us to study on Reformation Day. That would be fitting. All right, so this last section... Um, the, the heading there is, is the prayer of faith. Uh, so let's see what James has to say. Uh, so uh, we won't read the whole thing. We'll do it two chunks. So first, if someone could read verses 13 through 18. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. 
And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. All right, so James essentially here uh, is also, you know, he's, he's saying with, as St. Paul, right, he says, pray without ceasing. Um, James is saying essentially the very same thing, that in everything you are to pray. That, that should be your response as a Christian, is, is when bad things happen, pray. When good things happen, pray. Uh, when, when you're sick, Pray. If you can't pray, make sure you get the, the pastors and elders of the church to come to you so that they can pray on your behalf. Um, everything you do, prayer is the thing that we should do. Um, and and it, it is a powerful thing, right? We, you know, we're, we, as Lutherans, sometimes we're hesitant to um, talk about prayer being like powerful, and right, calling upon the Holy Spirit and His power to do things because of the you know the the Pentecostal and and evangelical ideas of you know well if you, if you pray with enough faith then you know you basically get to control how the Holy Spirit works by what you tell it to do Him to do, um, but that but this is that's not how we take it right we pray to God and prayer is powerful because of the one we're praying to, right? God is able to do anything. And so if you have a problem, pray to the one who is the only one who's able to fix that. Um, and so, and of course, Jesus commands us to pray. So that's one reason why we do it too. Uh, because if Jesus tells you to do something, you better do it. Um, th this is why we have the Lord's Supper. This is why we baptize this, you know, not only because Jesus told us, but he tells us because these are great gifts. Um, but, but he says to, to pray in, in all of these things. And note that, um, and, and this passage gets abused a little bit with, um, with the, how do I want to label them? Um, the, what is a good title for him? I'll think about it. Yeah. Right, praying in Jesus' name. Um, yeah, so when Jesus says, you know, to, to pray in his name, right, it doesn't mean that we just are supposed to tack Jesus' name onto the end of the prayer. Um, it's good to do that, right? We notice all of the prayers in, in the church service that we pray end with, you know, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Um, so we end in that Trinitarian way, or in short, we say, you know, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, right, we, we pray in his name, and it's good to mention that we're praying through him uh, so that no one is confused who we're praying to and through. Um, now, when he's talking about, you know, praying in his name, right, this is where a lot of people do get confused. And they say, well, I can pray anything, and as long as I say in Jesus' name, then it's a prayer in Jesus' name. Lord, I really want a Lamborghini in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> right? God's probably not going to grant that prayer. Right? And so to pray in Jesus' name is to, to pray according to his will. It is to, to pray, you know, that, that he would do what, he, what pleases him in, in my life. Um, that, and, and to pray in faith in that way. That's what it really means to pray in Jesus' name, um, not just tacking it on, right? Because you'll, you'll see lots of these, these people who, um, you know, usually they call themselves prophets or, you know, prophetesses if they're women or whatever. Um, and they'll, they'll say that, you know, you in faith can do anything, right? You, you know, you can 
you can heal people, right? And in, in, in Jesus' name, I heal you of your cancer. And they, you know, try and, although usually they don't try and cure things like cancer, they cure things like an aching back. And it's like, oh, hey, my back feels better. Um, it's never the big things. Um, that, that conference, that the, the prophecy conference I went to back in Oregon, um, they, they had a time where, where they, you could you know, write down the, the things that you wanted healed or fixed and, and that they would pray over it and do it. Um, and, so it and people would come forward and they all had things like, yeah, my, my arm hurts or my back hurts and all these little things. Um, I, I wrote down that they would, they would end COVID, um, but they didn't do that. So, um, so I guess their, their power only goes so far, but, but, but right, you know, and, and those, those kinds of people frustrate me too. They, they claim that they have healing powers in Jesus name. And I'm like, then why are you not at the hospital? Right? Why, why are you not in the cancer center? Right? It's like, stop lying, stop deceiving people. It really frustrates me. But anyway, that's a tangent that I won't go on. Um, so James is saying that we, we should pray in all things. And um, notice he says, right, that, um, let's see, where's the, oh, I'm in the wrong paragraph. Here we go. I was like, patience and suffering, that's in the, that, that's the last time. Right, and, and we've talked a bit about, yeah, the mustard seed size faith and praying and moving a mountain. Um, and there, there's kind of two things to note in that. Um, one is he is he's specifically addressing the apostles, the disciples. Um, and we do see in Acts the amazing things that they do when, when they are given the Holy Spirit. I mean, they're, they're healing people. They're raising people from the dead. Uh, St. Paul is, is bitten by a venomous snake, and everyone thinks he's going to die, but he's totally fine, right? And so the apostles, by the faith given by the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, do go on to do these amazing things. Um, so it's important to note that, you know, I don't think Jesus there is necessarily speaking to the everyday Christian, uh, but he is definitely speaking to the apostles there, um, in which they will go on to do amazing things. Uh-huh. Right, yeah, at, at the, I believe that's after the transfiguration. Jesus comes down from the mountain and, and you know, the, this guy brings his son who's demon-possessed to, to the disciples, but they are unable to, to cast him out. Um, and, you know, and, and Jesus, I think, yeah, he talks about, is, is it there that he talks about this unbelieving generation or, or something? Or it might just be you of little faith. It might be one of those. Um, but, right, he's addressing the disciples. The disciples are not a picture of faith before the resurrection, right? They, they, are, they are a picture of, of faithlessness for the most part. There, there are glimpses here and there of, of faith. But, but they, uh, most of the time they don't really understand who Jesus is or, or how he's able to do what he does. And, and so they really don't have... A, a strong faith at that point. Um, and, and so, so yeah, so that kind of a, a showing of their, their weakness in faith, but then they are strengthened in that, you know, after the resurrection and on Pentecost. Um, but then, you know, on that mustard seed thing, right, I, I argue that a mustard seed sized faith is impossible for us as sinful human beings to achieve. Um, that, you know, that, you know, cause, cause we can't, right? If you, if you go and pray that, you know, that the loft would be moved over into the high school parking lot, I would bet plenty of money that none of you would, would be able to do that, right? I certainly wouldn't be able to do that. Um, and, you know, I, if, if we are to take that, if, if we, if anyone can have a mustard seed, <coughs> size faith, um, then none of us do, right? But God be praised that any amount of faith saves us, right? And so, um, so, so yeah, so that, that's what I would say about that. Um, 
and why, why we can't move the mountains. Um, but so, so, yeah, so he's talking about prayer here. And, you know, and, and this, is, this is where some of those healing prophet people will, will point to, right? Verse 15, they'll say, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Right? They, they will take that to say, oh, well, he, saving the one who is sick means healing from their illness. And I would say, no, it doesn't. Saving someone from illness can be killing them. Right? If we, if we look at saving as in salvation, right? You know, the bringing into eternal life. Um, death now is a portal into that. And so, right, when, when we say, you know, save our loved ones from this illness, you know, God certainly has the power to, to heal them of that. And, and, and he does that, in, you know, on occasion. Uh, but it's also, and sometimes it's even a greater saving, I would argue a greater saving, uh, to, for the person to die and go into paradise, you know, where they will not have any suffering, anymore. Whereas the person who's just healed from their illness will eventually die and will continue to suffer, right? And so, so I think this saving that James is talking about is that salvific saving. And so the one who prays in faith, right, it, by, by praying it shows that they have faith in Christ, in God, to, to act. And so because he has that faith, however big, however small, that faith saves him. Um, and so, right, that he is saved and the Lord will raise him up. Not necessarily out of the hospital bed, but certainly on the last day. Right, this, this is what Jesus is getting at when he's talking with, um, I mean, the part of the teaching, when, when, when Lazarus has died, right? Lazarus has died and, and he, 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 he specifically waits, which is really interesting, right? He, he, he hears that Lazarus has died and instead of running to him, right, he waits, um, and then Martha comes to meet him, um, which is a great picture. You know, everybody likes to bash on Martha, but the, but the raising of Lazarus is a great story to show at that point that Martha's faith was stronger than Mary's. Um, you know, everybody points to, you know, when Martha gets upset that Mary's not helping in, her with the food and stuff, and Jesus says, you know, she's in the right place. She's doing what's best. That, that one thing needful. Um, but here, you know, Martha comes running to Jesus. Mary, Mary stays back and is weeping. Uh, Martha comes running to Jesus and she says, you know, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died, but I know that God will do whatever it is you desire. Um, and then when later, you know, Jesus gets to the tomb and Mary's there, Notice what she says. She just says, Lord, if you, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. That's it, right? She doesn't have that, tr at that point, that trust and acknowledgement that Christ is still able to do something for Lazarus. Um, so it's an interesting picture there of, you know, don't bash on, Mar on Martha too much. Um, and so, um, but what does, Jesus, what does Jesus tell Martha? Your brother will rise again. Right? And she, in great faith, in great faith and, and understanding of the scriptures, says, I know that he's going to live, you know, be raised from the dead on the last day. Right? She thinks that he is, you know, confessing the resurrection, which, again, great faith there. Um, and then, you know, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And, right? and he, you know, then goes and, and raises Lazarus to, to life. Um, that's a really interesting account, too. Um, you know, I, you always wonder, you know, we talked about asking questions to God and when we get to heaven. Um, <laughs> I, I want to I ask Lazarus what his thoughts were when he was raised from the dead, right? Did he get like brought out of heaven and back to, you know, he's with, he's in paradise. That's what we confess, but it's, yeah, just, <laughs> was he happy with Jesus or was he really like, like, come on, man, I had paradise going for me. Right, yeah. <laughs> So, but yeah, but, and so, um, so this salvation, right, that, that's what we're talking about. That's what James is talking about here. I, I argue that, that this is what he's addressing. And his sins, you know, if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. 
right? This is Christ's work for, for the, the sinner, to, to forgive the, the sins that they have committed. Um, and so, right, he says this is, this is what will happen to the person who prays uh, and who has, has faith in God. And so then he tells you what to do. He says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, I, I didn't look up the Greek on this. If the Greek is that the Greek word sozo, which can mean healing, but it can also mean save. Um, so like the, the healing of the 10 lepers, right? When it, when it says at the end, when the one Samaritan comes back and Jesus says, your faith has made you well or has healed you, right? The Greek word there can also mean your faith has saved you, like salvation. Um, so I, I didn't look it up. I, so I don't know if that is the term there for that. Um, but, right, that he says, you know, confess your sins and, and be, you know, be absolved um, that you may be healed or saved or, you know, whatever. Um, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Um, and again, this doesn't necessarily mean, right, that you can go and move mountains or, you know, great power in that regard. But, right, why, why does any prayer have power? It's because of God and him working. Um, and so that is why prayer has power. It's not your faith that, that makes it strong. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> um, then he goes into discussing Elijah um, and, you know, gives an example of, of him, right? That, that he, you know, that he has a nature like ours. So he's saying, you know, this is a person like you, not, not like Christ, who, who is perfect, um, and he says that he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it didn't rain. So, right, he prayed to God, and God gave, gave the answer. And then he prayed again that the rains would come, and, and they did. Right, and so there's an example in Scripture of a faithful man praying to God and an answer given. Um, and so, now there's also examples of faithful men praying to God and God giving an answer that they don't want. Or, or uh, answer that they don't, you know, aren't that they want sooner than right? You know, prayers to to come out of the exile when Israel's in in exile, they're praying, you know, bring us back, save us from this. And God says, you know, seventy years, right? You gotta you gotta wait a certain amount of time. Um, so so there are times that there you know that God takes His time in answering. Um, you know, in the Exodus, right? They, they were in slavery for 400 years. Now, were they, I don't know if they were praying that God would bring them out of that for the entirety of that 400 years. But even when, you know, when they, when the, when the scriptures say, you know, <clears throat> that, this, that the people prayed out to God um, and God heard them, and then, you know, he didn't do it immediately. It's not like he struck down Pharaoh and, and brought his people out right away. Right, he brought up Moses, and and Moses then you know went through his life and and went out, and then burning bush happened, and then he brought back, and then he did all of the different plagues, and then they finally brought him out. So it was a lot slower than probably the Israelite people were thinking when they were crying out to God, saying, "Deliver us from this," um, which is a great example for us that when you see evil things happening and you're praying and it seems like nothing is happening. It's not like God is not hearing you. God is hearing your prayers. He promises to do so, but he's just probably acting in a different way than you think he should be acting, in which case you should repent of your sin and say, God knows what's best and he will act in his timing. And so continue to pray in the meanwhile, um, but know that he will act um, in, in his timing. Yeah. Right, the intertestamental period, right? Um, yeah, that there's this, this period of, of like 400 years or so um, between the end of the Old Testament, um, the, you know, the last prophets, and, and then in the New Testament with, um, with John the Baptist. And so in this time, we don't have any, you know, scripture that, that is, you know, yeah, God working through prophets or, or, you know, speaking in this way that he had before. Um, 
This, no, it is not. Um, we, the, the Roman Catholics, of course, would argue that you know, this is when the, the um, Apocrypha is written, like Maccabees and Bell and the Dragon and all these things. Um, so, I mean, so the people will look at the, the dating and like the events of what we see in the, the Old Testament prophets, you know, where they were. Um, and then they, they see this, you know, that then the history of, you know, Jesus being born, right? We have the, the Roman Empire is, is well established at that point um, when the Roman Empire did not exist at all in the Old Testament. And so just looking at history, right, you can piece together that there is a gap between Old Testament and New Testament. Um, looking at other historical documents and references to, you know, the, the events in, in Scripture. Um, and yeah, and the, the Apocrypha, um, we, we don't recognize it as an official part of the biblical canon, um, and which the Roman Catholic Church, I don't think they actually technically approved it as the canon until sometime in the 16th century. Um, but um, but they, they include it now. And it's largely just historical stuff. So it's, it's not necessarily bad to read um, the, the Apocrypha. I have not read the whole thing. Um, but it, it, there's a lot of history in there. Um, and so it's not bad to read. You know, read it, read it knowing that this is not, you know, inspired by God scripture. Um, we could. Yeah, the CPH actually has put out a, a copy of, it's like the Lutheran Study Bible, but the Apocrypha with Lutheran commentary on it. Um, so, yeah, that's something that we could do at some point, study the Apocrypha. Right, yeah, yeah. Just because there's no official scripture for that time period doesn't mean that God wasn't acting, right? Of course, God is always present with his people um, and you know, working for them, right? But there just was no, like, active prophet that was proclaiming, like an Elijah or Elisha or John the Baptist. Yeah. Any other questions? What is the time frame for the New Testament? The time frame for the New Testament? Oh, it depends on who you talk to. Um, <laughs> Jesus was born, depending on how you want to date it, somewhere between 2 BC and like 0, 1 AD, somewhere, somewhere in that. Um, the turn from BC to AD, of course, is based on the birth of Christ. Um, and so, um, and so, that, that, so it's just, it starts around there. Um, and then, you know, if, if he was born zero, let's just say that, then, you know, Jesus lived 33 years. And so, right, he was, he was, so he died 33 AD. Um, and then the, the last New Testament writing, which we date, or which we say is Revelation, um, that that is written probably, oh, when is, the, what is the dating for that? Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, like 60, it, it's before the, the fall, the destruction of the temple, which was 70 AD. Is that right? So, so I, I think it was in the 60 AD range. And of course, that, that is early dating. The, the, you will hear many arguments that say that, you know, nothing in the New Testament was written before 60 AD. Um, these comes from higher critics and all these things, you know, um, especially with, you know, the Gospels and things, because they'll, Jesus makes reference to the destruction of the temple, and they say, well, how could he make reference to the destruction of the temple without, you know, knowing that, that it was going to be destroyed? And it's like, well, maybe because he's God? I don't know. Um, or, or that these writers were inspired by God, right? There's, there's biblical answers to these questions. Um, but yeah, so other people will move the dating of these books to, to really late, like late first century, even early second century. Um, but yeah, mo all of the books of scripture we would say are written between like 40 and 70 AD, somewhere in that, in that range. Um, 
What point was I making on that? Oh, the timing of the New Testament, right. Um, yeah, so, so, so we get, yeah, basically Jesus is born at zero, let's say. And then, you know, the, New Testa- the last New Testament book is written, let's say, 70 A.D., just for, just for simplicity's sake. But, so, yeah, about 70 years there. <clears throat> um, all right, so, so, yeah, pray. Pray in all that you do. Um, and then this last section, we'll just hit real quick so that we can finish today. Um, if someone could read those last two verses, 19 and 20. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and recover a multitude of sins. All right, so, right, this is a, a great passage to say right? Don't just say, oh, well, if someone's sinning, right, you can't do anything about them, right? They, they don't judge them, all, all that stuff. James here says, right, if someone wanders from the truth, right, they're, they're going into sin, false teaching, all this stuff, um, and you bring them back, right, you are doing the greatest justice for them possible, Right? You are bringing them out of falsehood, out of lies, out of death, if they go as far as to be unbelieving, bringing them back into life, um, right? that you, you will save his soul from death. Right? And that, that is the greatest good, the, great, the most loving thing that you can ever do for someone. So when you hear the world saying, oh, well, it's loving to just you know, accept people's sins and let them do what they want, no. James says no. Because by bringing them back into the truth, you are saving their soul from death. And we'll cover a multitude of sins, right? If they, if they leave the truth and they, you know, live this whole life of, of sin and, you know, just living a horribly immoral life, right? If they repent and are brought back into the church, then they will be forgiven of all of that sin. And, right, and so this, this act of repentance and forgiveness can cover a multitude of sins. Uh, and so, so this is what James urges, is that we are to point people back to that truth, not just be content when say, oh, well, I know you're living in this bad way and doing these bad things, and so I'm just going to you know, pretend like it's not a big deal. Right? We, we are to love them, of course, but we are to, in doing that, to say, you know, this is, this is what the scriptures say. This is what the truth is. Um, and so that is the greatest good that we can do, which is why we, we always should be praying uh, for the unbeliever, for the, those who are acting in evil ways, that they would turn from that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that they would turn from that and be forgiven. Uh, of their sins uh, when they become repentant. Well, you said you wish bad things upon right, you should not wish bad things upon anyone, right? We, we should pray for our enemies, love our enemies. Um, yeah, absolutely. We are, and we are to speak well of our neighbor, right? Eighth commandment. We are to honor them, speak well of them, uh, explain everything in the kindest way, right? Build up their reputation, um, I was reading the Luther in the large catechism on the eighth commandment. Um, and it's, man, I, I love the way that Luther talks. It's so great. He's so straightforward and so blunt. <laughs> um, yeah, oh yeah, for sure. He's talk, he was talking about how, you know, people who love to gossip and, and, you know, spread lies about their neighbor, that they are like, they're like filthy pigs who love to just roll around in their own slop. <laughs> like, it's, it's so good because it's so true. All right, we love our sin. We love our sin and we love to, you know, get other people to roll in the mud with us. Um, but he says, right, that if, if you are not in a position to, you know, to, to, to bring judgment against someone, uh, then when you, you should not spread slander against them, hurt their reputation, even if they've done something, you know, in private wrong, right? If someone sins against me, I'm not, you know, pr- privately, I'm not supposed to go and then, you know, say, hey, guess what this person did, right? No, I, Luther says that you should make your ears like a tomb and, and close them so that nothing can come out. 
Um, and, and so that's what we're to We're to put the best construction. We're to speak well and build up the reputation of our neighbor, um, even when maybe they don't deserve it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right, yeah. What, ha- what happens when you're, someone does something to your family, right? Yeah. Yeah, we, you know, ultimately, yeah, we are not the judge, right? So, so when someone does wrong, we, our, our first response should not be, I'm going to get back at that person, or I'm going to make sure that they are brought to justice, right? That's God's work. It's not, that's not our role. Now, are we to protect our family? Yes, we can protect our family. You know, uh, we can stand up. You know, part of the Eighth Commandment is standing up for the person who is being slandered, right? So if, if your child is being, or, or a sibling or whatever, is being spoken of in a bad way and their reputation is being hurt, you know, it is the Christian duty to stand up and defend that person and say, what you're speaking is false. Right? This person is you know, good in this way and not what you are saying. Right? So we as Christians should stand up and defend the, the person who is being slandered. And that includes you know, anyone, even a stranger. Right? If, if people are gossiping about someone you don't even know, right, you should go up and at, at minimum say, are you putting the best construction on what they're doing and what they're saying? Because, well, right, yeah, and they'll probably slander you then too, but right then they have to answer to the judge who can send them to hell. So, you know, that's their problem. Um, <laughs> the moment when you don't want it to be between you and God, right? Um, and so, but that, but, and so, so we, we pray, we, we stand up for those, and we, we pray that God brings those people into the faith, right? All right, that is the end of James. Any last questions? with like, well, technically we're over time, but like two minutes left. Yeah. Uh, Luther ruled he didn't care too much for James. Was, what was his point of view there that made him adverse to him? Oh, Luther not liking James. Um, well, he's kind of, it, it's kind of split, right? Because he'll, there will be, there are quotes from him where he talks about James, you know, in a very negative way. Um, where he is, you know, he calls it an epistle of straw that, you know, you shouldn't build foundation upon this gospel um, or on this epistle when, when there are epistles like Romans and, you know, Galatians and these, these kinds of things, um, which he loved those, right, because they very clearly talked about the cross. Um, James doesn't as clearly talk about Christ's passion and his sacrificial death on the cross for the sins of the world, which is why he didn't, that, that's part of why he didn't like it as much. Um, I think a big part in him having this kind of more negative look at it um, is that the Roman Catholics love James because they twist it to make it look like works righteousness, right? You know, faith without works is dead, so you better do works if you want to be saved right? That's what, that's what they teach. And so Luther, you know, saw that they loved James, and being the good Lutheran he was, says, well, I hate James, <laughs> you know, um, which probably wasn't the right way to go, but, but right, every, and, and this is important to, to remind ourselves, that anytime you're reading any work written by anyone, you always have to remember the context in which they're writing, right? Because if you just take it out of context, you can do anything with it. But, right, Luther is writing specifically against the Roman Catholic Church and their teachings. And so the things he says, right, are going to be directed at that. Um, and, you know, this, when, when Luther is writing, you know, that, that famous work, um, maybe it's not so famous, but for people who like to hate on Luther, it is, um, you know, the Jews and their lies, right? People are like, whoa, that's, that's anti-Semitic. That's pretty bad. Um, What's the context of that, though? He's writing in reaction to something the Jews wrote that said the Christians and their lies, right? And so, so there's a whole different context that, you know, about this. So we always have to remember the context in which they're writing. Luther did actually, throughout 
uh, his life and in many works did quote James uh, to, to support, you know, the truth. And so at times he, he spoke ill of it, but other times he used it. I mean, it's, it's quoted in the large catechism in multiple spots. Um, I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure it's quoted in our confessions. Uh, and so, you know, it's not like Luther thought that James, sh- you know, at times he said it shouldn't be in the canon, but that was because he, he saw how the Roman Catholics were using it, and he said it's better to just get rid of it than to leave it and people be led into false doctrine. So, right, God breathed, yeah, that, yeah. And so that gets into the discussion of there's, you know, what is it, homo legomena and anti legomena, which is fancy. Basically, there are certain books in the in the scriptures that at these councils for for you know saying the scriptures that some of the books everybody was in full agreement on, including and some of the books there was some discussion, right? There were some doubts with certain books. James is one of those. Revelation is one of those. Uh, Hebrews is one of those. Uh, and so, not not to say that these are not you know yeah, inspired by God's scripture, right? We believe that that, that it is. Um, but that's, there, there are some debate back there, people who take that kind of stuff seriously. Um, but right, but we can read it and we look at it. It, it is scripture. It is inspired by God. Um, there's nothing false in here, right? In, in what we're reading in James. So... Right. Well, and, and the metaphor he uses is from first, I think it's first Corinthians. I forget the chapter, but it's talking about like, it's not, yeah, it's not saying worthless. It's, he's talking about, you know, building foundations, right? And, and he lists all of these materials and, and straw is the last one. Cause right. You, you really don't want to be building your foundation for your house out of straw um, because it'll, it won't be as strong. And so he says, right, when you're, when you're building the foundation for your faith, don't look at James, look at things like Romans and um, Galatians and, and whatnot. Um, so, but yeah, it, it's not useless. And, and his, his critique of it is, yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's completely true, right? We, we, don't, we don't have to subscribe to Luther's, you know, some of Luther's words on, on James, um, but it is a good book to study. I hope you've gotten a lot out of the, the, the book of James. Um, we will, uh, next week, as long as I can get everything prepared for it, um, we will be looking at um, Genesis uh, next week. Um, and, and Luther, you know, we, Luther hated James, but he, he taught on and wrote commentary for, uh, for Genesis. Um, some of his Luther's works cover that. So, so we'll be able to also look at his specific words on, on things like the creation and um, various parts of, of that book. So, so we'll be looking at Genesis next week. So um, get ready for that. Um, yeah, we'll stop there. So, all right, James, we got through pretty quick. So that's pretty good. Um, all right, let us close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of the book of James uh, and that the the wonderful teachings it gives us that uh, we are we are saved by faith and that that faith lives itself out in good works it produces good works that that we are to go and and love you by loving our neighbor around us Uh, keep us always living according to your will uh, that we would be pleasing in your sight and that where we fall short Uh, We may confess our sins and know that we will receive salvation, forgiveness and salvation from you. Bless us as we go about uh, this week, uh, that we may remain steadfast in you and that we would uh, continue on into eternal life. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody.